the uh, property tax division really well. Now my meeting to um, order, and we can note that we do have quorum to conduct lawful business. Um, first on the agenda is to approve uh, the minutes. Vice Chair Lee, have you had an opportunity to review, and do you have a motion? Uh, I've had an opportunity to review the minutes from January 25th, and I, I move to approve the minutes. It's been, motion's been made. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, we have three bills up. Uh, who's the first one? Oh, that would be me. So I will turn the gavel over to uh, Vice Chair Lee as I run up to the other one. Chair Listelgard, do you um, move to lay over House File 825 for possible consideration in an omnibus bill? So moved, Chair Lee. All right, so good morning, everyone. Um, Chair Listelgard, do you want to give an overview of your bill? Well, thank you, um, Chair and members, for the opportunity to present House File 825 today, uh, a bill concerning the needs to fix our state payment in lieu of taxes um, known as PILT which became law in 1979. The purpose of PILT is to compensate local units of government for their lost tax base from state ownership of land and the need to provide services to the counties. Uh, the amount of uh, the average lost tax base for many northern counties is extremely high. There are 22 counties impacted. Um, the county that I represent, 63 percent of the land is owned publicly. Without adequate PILT payments, northern counties have to raise property taxes disproportionately on their residents to provide and pay for existing county services, all on this extremely uh, diminished tax base. Then they have to raise them again even further to help pay and provide many needed services on these state lands. Uh, members, last session, uh, last session, the House Tax Committee heard this and it was included. Um, this is a bipartisan bill, which I'm proud of, and it is supported by our local um, units of government, including the counties and the townships. And so with me today, um, I have a number of testifiers, uh, Keith, Nelson, uh, Keith Carlson, um, and he will walk through what PILT is, if that's okay. Yes, Mr. Carlson. Sure. No pressure, I'll heat it up for you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I am Keith Carlson. I'm a consultant to what's called the Northern Counties Land Use Coordinating Board, uh, who's worked with Representative Liz Lagarde on the uh, contents of this legislation. Uh, just to give uh, the committee some background on what PILT is, PILT stands for Payment in Lieu of Taxes. Uh, and it's paid uh, to deal, ha as Representative Liz Lagarde said, with the tax base loss due to the state ownership of natural resources land uh, and the additional uh, burdens placed on uh, the counties uh, and other local units uh, for those lands. Um, I will mention that uh, the executive summary, which is uh, in hard copy and available to the uh, committee me division members, is also posted on the Northern Counties Land Use Coordinating Board website has long with, along with the complete study. Uh, the program has been around since 1979. Uh, all 87 counties receive monies from it, and as well as townships and school districts to a lesser extent. Although a significant element to the state's <coughs> environmental policies, the jurisdiction for the program has always been in this committee. Um, it's grown substantially uh, from starting out in uh, 1979 with the first payment in 1980 of five and a half million dollars approximately. In 2022, it was a $36,488,000 or a 562% increase. Uh, the issue is, uh, particularly for the northern counties, is that that uh, increase has not been distributed uh, equitably. Um, it's not been aligned with the, uh, where the eligible lands are located. As I think is obvious to most of the members of this uh, committee, 
the vast majority of state-owned natural resources land is in the northern third, roughly, of Minnesota. But yet the payments or the increases in the payments that I just went through predominantly have gone to southern Minnesota. Uh, the reason why is because of the formula uh, dictates that uh, how the additional monies went out and uh, the valuation of one of those categories. There are three major categories for PILF. Uh, first is acquired natural resources land, land administered by the DNR, and that was generally acquired through purchase, condemnation, or gift. Um, second is DNR administered other natural resources land that was not acquired by purchase, uh, condemnation, or gift. Um, a large category in this area is the school trust fund lands. Uh, finally, there's county administered other natural resources land, which is generally tax forfeited land outside the cities. Uh, the payment scheme uh, has it started out and what it is currently for acquired natural resources land. Uh, it's $3 per acre starting back in 79. It's now at the higher of $5.13.3 per acre or three quarters of 1%. For the county administered other natural resources land, started out at 75 cents per acre, it's at $2 an acre currently. For DNR or commissioner administered other natural resources land, started out at a very low 37 and a half cents per acre, uh, it's now at $2 per acre as well. Um, so the changes in these categories, as I've alluded to, the vast amount of the increases have gone to this acquired natural resources land, even though that is the lowest category in terms of percentage terms. Uh, there's approximately one and a half million acres of acquired natural resources of land. Uh, there's far more, substantially more than four million acres in the largest category DNR administered. But yet, as I indicated, acquired natural resources land has received an increase of $19,579,000 or nearly 1,100% over the 41-year term of the program. The county administered has seen an increase of 3,471,000, 65%, and DNR administered has received uh, the largest category, an increase of 6,432,000 or 265%. Um, as a consequence of all these issues, uh, from the Northern County's Land Use Coordinating Board's perspective, we don't think the purposes of the program as identified specifically in the statute have, met, have been met. This includes, as uh, the representative indicated, compensating <coughs> local units of government for the loss of tax base uh, to address the disproportionate impact of state ownership of natural resources land on local units of government with large proportions of these properties. There are several counties that more than 50% of their acreage is captured in these uh, properties. And finally, to address the need to manage uh, state lands held in trust. These are the tax forfeited or county administered other natural resources land. Uh, as indicated, the failure to meet the statutory purposes of PILT uh, along with the growing disparities in the amount of PILT received on a per acre basis raises a fundamental question of the fairness of the existing formula. Uh, the three quarters of 1% payment option for the, nat for the acquired natural resources land is the main driver of this inequity. Um, some counties have seen uh, the reimbursement rate on a per acre basis increase more than 10,000% over the 41 year life of the program. Uh, others have this been essentially frozen and as you can see by this map, uh, the band across the uh, top of the state, all they've seen is that their uh, payment for the acquired natural resources land has gone from $3 to $5.13.3 per acre. The disparity between the highest and the lowest um, paid county has increased substantially since 1996, since this three quarter 1% payment option. It used to be the disparity was a factor of eight. Now the disparity is 170 times. The highest compensated county on a per acre basis receives more than 170 times reimbursement 
that the lowest compensated county receives. Uh, I'm not gonna go into detail uh, on this next slide, but um, again, you know, has the program kept up with inflation? Well, it depends. What type of land do you have in your county? If it's acquired natural resources land and you've seen healthy growth in the valuation of these properties, it's more than kept up with inflation. The average compensation for those on the three quarters of 1% basis is $22.17. Just keeping up with inflation, that would be about $13. Uh, the county administers clearly is not keeping up. DNR administered is maybe you can say it's kept up with inflation, but remember it started out at a very low 37 and a half cents. The one other item that we looked at in our study was, is it meeting its obligation to compensate counties for um, the loss in tax base? And we've concluded for a number of counties, that's not the case. Uh, the 10 most um, undercompensated counties are all located in Northern Minnesota uh, with St. Louis topping the list at $4,610,000 uh, loss relative to what they would receive if the properties had been on the tax, the tax base, with Hubbard uh, being the smaller. I will mention if you go on to the next 10, uh, there are several southern counties, Lacapara, uh, Stearns, and uh, Winona counties who are also find themselves in an undercompensated position. So what all this is culminated in and is captured almost entirely in Representative Liz Ligar's bill is the following proposal. One, to increase PILT aid for the county and DNR administered other natural resources land by $1 per acre. This kind of allows them to partially catch up, but I emphasize only partially. Second, for those with large proportions of their acreage captured uh, in the state-owned natural resources land, to give them an additional aid of 18 cents per acre for those counties where pilt land is more than 25% of the county's total acreage, or eight cents per acre for those where the acreage is from 10 to 25%. I will note um, that num number two, um, does provide compensation to 10 northern counties or 92% of the school trust fund land that provides over $40 million uh, for the state's aid to school districts throughout the state is located. Uh, the last one is to prevent cuts in PILT aid by holding counties harmless for valuation reductions. Uh, this was a phenomenon that occurred in 2016 effective for aid and payable in 2017 where some counties saw drops in the value of their acquired natural resources land. And then a study of valuing Lakeshore within the program. Um, the last slide here just shows where these increases go. I will emphasize 85 of the 87 counties actually receive increases, but the ones identified in white are nominal increases. No county loses money under this proposal. With that, I'll conclude, be happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you, Mr. Carlson. Um, I think we are gonna hold for member discussion towards the end because we have so many witnesses today. Um, and I'd like to call uh, Mr. McDonald up next. Great. Okay, Commissioner, please state your name and your organization for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Paul McDonald, uh, St. Louis County Commissioner. I reside in Ely, Minnesota. Thank you. Uh, again, thank you, Madam Chair, and members, for the opportunity today. Uh, again, I represent a district as large as the state of Rhode Island and runs from the outskirts of Duluth to the Canadian border, and a very large portion, portion of my district is pilt lands and public lands. And I understand. Uh, you know, the importance for most Minnesotans, they love to come to northern Minnesota and recreate. And we have millions and millions of acres of public land. We are re region rich in natural resources and we're subject to the reality of a rural economy. Uh, again, we need a healthy local economy and good jobs with half the land not eligible for development or paying any property taxes. 
many of our local communities in my district and county and other counties in the uh, northern coordinating land use uh, have an issue with this. And this, this is a good bill. I remember working with uh, Representative, now Commissioner Marquardt, on this uh, last year, and uh, he was very happy to support it. Again, we, our feeling is we can't expect uh, <coughs> state uh, or county governments to to have this disproportionate share, and this would be property tax relief to every citizen in the state of Minnesota. And when you when you look at that, uh, I think significant property tax relief relief in this day and age is something that resonates with each and every Minnesotan. So. Uh, you know, today less than 10% of the state pill payments are going to northern Minnesota counties, even though 95% of all pilt lands are located in this northern area. So fortunately, uh, Representative Lizagar's bill, House File 825, includes a major reform to the state pill program to reduce this unfair disparity in pill payments. Additionally, it provides other needed changes to help restore Pilt statutory purpose outlined in Minnesota Statute 477A 10, and that is to address the disappro disappropriate impact of state land ownership on counties with a large proportion of state land and to compensate them for lost tax base. And I uh, am happy to testify in, in support of this bill and uh, look forward to what's next. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. And we have Supervisor Upton. <clears throat> okay. Please state your name and your organization for the record. Uh, my name is John Upton. I am a supervisor at Ellsberg Township, which is located in St. Louis County between Virginia and Duluth, Minnesota. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and the committee members. I'm here with Minnesota, Minnesota Association of Townships to support the bill, House File 825, authored by Representative Lizelgard. Um, that has to do with payment in lieu of taxes. St. Louis County has non-taxable land, approximately 63% or over 2 million, 2 million acres is non-taxable. Uh, the amount continues to increase at the same time townships are about 75% tax dependent and the cost to provide township services are increasing. Uh, when land goes non-taxable, we still have the same responsibility to provide roads, fire protection, and other services, but without the support of the tax revenue from these lands. We're thankful for the, <coughs> the PILT program offers some reimbursement to the township, but when land becomes non-taxable, there's a problem in that system. The problem is that non-taxable land is eventually reassessed and the value drastically decreases and that leads to the pill payment decreasing. Towns have come to dislike any part of the lands becoming non-taxable because we expect that in about eight years the pill program will end up paying very little to compensate the township for the loss of the tax revenue. The Minnesota Association of Townships would like to hold townships harmless dollar for dollar from lost tax revenue by seeking increased sustainable and dedicated funding for the payment in lieu of taxes program and the assurances that <clears throat> the value of these lands will not be decreased only because they become non-taxable. We support this legislation and thank you for your time. Great, thank you. Mr. Hilgar. Okay. Please state your name and your organization for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Matt Hilgart. I work for the Association of Minnesota Counties. AMC represents all of Minnesota's 87 counties. I want to thank Chair Lislegard for carrying this major county priority. PILT has been, PILT funding has been an AMC priority for close to a decade now. And it's important to note that while this bill is affecting northern counties, our board still voted this as a priority because PILT affects us all. In uh, Representative Anderson's district, uh, an acre of Eglin that's taken out of production, 
um, can mean $17,000 uh, worth of value lost. Um, and so it's important just in mm -hmm. Southern Minnesota as it is when it happens in Hennepin County, as it is when it happens in St. Louis County. And that is a good reminder of what PILT is set up to do. PILT at its core is a recognition by the state of the direct and indirect costs of conservation to local communities. We like to see conservation as an added benefit in our communities, but we also want to make sure that we're protecting tax base and the services that we want to deliver to our citizens. So in cities or in counties like um, what uh, Chair McDonald said uh, in St. Louis, where PILT is a significant important part of their budget, we also have counties where 90% of their tax base is tax exempt. So we wanna just underscore that we appreciate this bill. We see it as uh, much needed and uh, would stand for any questions if you have any. Thank you again. Great, thank you, Mr. Hilgard. Um, Commissioner Massman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Matt Mossman, uh, Minnesota Inter-County Association. MICA represents uh, 15 of Minnesota's larger, faster-growing counties, including St. Louis County. Thank you for the time. Sure. Do you want us to refer to you as commissioner? Uh, no, you can refer okay. to me as, as Matt is fine. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Just wanted to check. Um, I, I just will add, because many of the, we agree with the, many of the policy points that have been uh, made, and this also has been a longstanding part of our um, priorities in the tax and fiscal policy area. And so just really want to underscore and emphasize um, why that has been the case for such a long period of time. Um, we, uh, these, these lands um, uh, need, need services, emergency services, fire, medical, law enforcement, solid waste, the whole gamut of services and the cost for these services uh, have been rising over time like costs have been rising for all counties. And as uh, the reimbursement <coughs> rates particularly for these natural resource county and DNR administered lands have not kept pace with the cost of delivering services and with inflation. Um, it's consistent with a theme of ours that it, it undermines and erodes really the relationship and the original intent for these programs in the first place, which is to support um, and help fund those services to tax exempt uh, lands, particularly in areas like um, St. Louis County where there's such a large and disproportionate amount of those lands. Um, that exists. So we strongly support this legislation, look forward. And I just would uh, add and point out that um, there, tax exempt, or there are tax exempt natural resource lands in all counties, all counties support uh, PILT and none of those other counties will either receive less or, or be diminished uh, in those other categories of land by uh, the adoption of this bill to, to fund um, the natural resource lands at a higher rate. So we support this legislation strongly. Look forward to working with Chair Liz Lagarde to get it to the governor's desk this session. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Mr. Fenske. Good morning, Chair Vang. I'm Steve Fenske with the Minnesota Association of Townships. Um, I'd like to thank Chair Liz Lagarde and the co-authors for offering this bill. It's, this is an issue that townships have been addressing with our county partners for a long time because of the shortcomings it has uh, in the program. And I think uh, Supervisor Upton provided a good statement of some of the real world effects on local governments related to the emergency services that they have to keep providing the maintenance of roads that people need to use to go access those public lands. Um, so I want to thank the committee for considering this. Thank you. Great, thank you. Are there any public witnesses that wish to testify? Okay, seeing none, we'll move to member discussion. Representative Qualm. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in order to get a better interactive uh, understanding, I understand there is uh, special mining revenue in that area. And I know part of the reason why that is there is because of the, uh, you know, compensation for the lack of, of taxes and, and et cetera. It'd be nice to ha understand that component by, by county. Um, county aid factors, the county aid factors take into effect the lack of, um, you know, privately owned uh, tax roll uh, property, or is that just not part of the equation? 
Um, Chair Lissagard, would you like to refer this to um, one of the witnesses? I think. Mr. Carlson. Mr. Carlson. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, members. Um, the representative is correct, is there is a factor within the county program aid formula that um, supposedly takes into account um, the county tax base. But the reality is, is that the county aid formula is substantially underfunded. Uh, in order for it to really compensate for the loss of tax base, the cost of the program would be ha have to be doubled. Um, so right now, its role is to provide an indice uh, to distribute the underfunded uh, fund amounts that currently go out. So it's, um, in, in my estimate, uh, has somebody who's been very involved with that formula over the years, um, a minor, a relatively minor issue. Mr. Quam, follow up. Uh, Madam Chair, um, I, I think the you know the author. The interaction of these different programs, it would be good that when we fix one, we look at uh, fixing the other one so that as a unit, uh, we maybe have a more whole because certain things interact with parts of the state, I think, differently. Um, it'd be nice also to have data um, as we talk to these bills that has the uh, like the PILT dollars per taxpayer by county, uh, miles of roads by county, uh, population density by county, and then property tax capacity per uh, population uh, by county. So a lot of these major factors that interact with the aid here and in different programs so we've got that as a background. Um, I enjoy the uh, the look at PILT. Um, it's it's timely. However, I do uh, think that when we do change that program, we have to look at the interactions with all the other programs. But thank thank the author and thank you, Madam Chair. Sure. Um, and actually, I think Michelle can speak to uh, what you were mentioning. Um, Chair Lee and Representative Quam, um, I can safely say I don't have all of that information available at this time, but we can, I can confer with Mr. Swanson and we can get some of that information for you. But I will say that in your packet you have a table that looks like this that takes, uh, um, it lays out current law and the rates for each of the different land types. Uh, and it also shows where this particular bill, House File 825, would increase certain components of the formula, mm -hmm. and that well, does Michelle, take into account. Michelle, can you tell us which packet you're referring to? Um, it's a single page table. Uh, no, Ms. Uh, Representative Quam. Uh, if you don't have this one, it was posted online. If you don't have it, um, we can make sure you. It may get not it. be in everyone's packet. Okay. Yeah. But we will get a copy to um, the committee members. Okay. And but it does have detail on how the bill increases the one uh, the two dollar rate to three dollars, and for each county administered land. DNR ministered land, and then also the component uh, that is newly presented representing, I call it density equalization, uh, where uh, Mr. Carlson and others have talked about counties with uh, pilt land that re reflects 25% of the overall total of land in the county. So you have some detail uh, available there, and we can get further information for you. Representative Kwam. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, oftentimes, uh, it's cumbersome to have the laptop scrolling through the material, so that's why it's nice to have it actually right here, then we can make notes upon it. Um, but the, the details and additional information, uh, having that so we can keep it in reference, because next week and the week after, we'll have other bills 
Absolutely. Yeah. I don't have the copy yeah. either. So <laughs> yes, I think we will make, uh, we will endeavor to have everything printed out next time we meet. Uh, I think I have next Mr. Uh, Representative Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Question, I, I maybe should know the answer, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Um, talking about how PILT funds are, are broken down once they get to the local level. Are they distributed like other property tax dollars to the county, township, school boards in that same proportion? I think, Mr. Carlson. Madam Chair, uh, Representative, no, it is not distributed exactly like uh, property tax dollars. There's a statutory distribution to counties and depending on the type of land to townships and to school districts. It varies again by the classification and that's developed over, over history as some of this actually predates PILT and some of it uh, has been um, set at the initial inception. Much of it was set, set at the initial inception but there have been some minimal changes that have occurred since then. Thank you. Uh, Representative Anderson, follow up? Yeah, just to follow up, could you give a little bit more detail in terms of, uh, in terms of that breakdown compared to taxes? Who gets more and who gets less? Um, Madam Chair, Representative As Anderson, the bulk of the money goes mm -hmm. to counties. And then probably the next largest chair goes to townships. Uh, and then um, there's an amount that goes to some school districts, again, depending on the category of land. For me to go into more detail, I'd have to do that in writing. I'd be happy to provide that to you. If you That's like. fine. That's All fine. right. Representative Anderson, are you? Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, next on our list, we have Representative Hewitt. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, I have more of a statement here that I want to make sure that I raise up. Um, and Chair Lizagard, and I love saying Chair Lizagard, um, I want to thank you for bringing this forward. And two, three of your testifiers today brought something really interesting to the table here about basically let's call it public safety because the stories that come out of Minnesota, especially in your area right now of our lack of or our, our challenges with this, your area has a unique area because to do a rescue in our DNR areas can drain a budget. Um, you do three of those rescues a year that they run about twenty-five to $30,000 each because of the uniqueness of them and getting back in there, maybe having to take a canoe to somebody that's having a heart attack. That's all going to have to come out in revenue, and the state has to step up and do what's right here. Um, we need to start paying for these people that have volunteered. They work a full-day job. Then they head out in their canoe to go rescue somebody 20 miles into, the, you know, into your area on public land. So I want to really thank you for bringing this up, and I want to thank the commissioners for coming down and talking about this, because this is important. And it's not just your people that live there. These are people from Rosemount, Apple Valley, that go up and enjoy your lands, and yet don't pay for it. So thank you. Mr. Uh, Mr. Carlson, any comments? Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Hewitt, for, for uplifting that, and, and thank you to all of our first responders. Uh, next, we have Representative DeScroll. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just want to kind of build on what Representative Hewitt was talking about. Um, I know that um, from time to time I've heard this from other members of the legislature and, and uh, local leaders that when you have um, the state having like regional offices with MnDOT or the state patrol and things where those are not taxable lands but they still have to provide um, services for the roads and, and what have you for those facilities or uh, part of our Minnesota state system and part of the University of Minnesota system. And a lot of these uh, reside in small smaller communities where there is a bigger burden that's bare borne by the, the locals for um, having these facilities in their communities. Um, you know, those are again, to represent Hugh's point, people who are most likely not going to be living in the community that are going to be taking advantage of those things and the locals yet are, uh, as the host community asked, to, to bear that extra burden. So the question is, um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure I know the answer to it, that it's not addressed in this bill, but to Ms. Schill, do we have anything that we have in the past in the way of property tax relief or has that ever been contemplated for um, communities where they are smaller, where they have a disproportionately large number of publicly owned properties in those communities to be able to help subsidize what they provide as a benefit or good for the community as at large? Uh, I'll direct this to Ms. Schill and maybe also Mr. Swanson if he has thoughts. Um, 
Chair Lee and Representative O'Driscoll. I would say most of the items uh, on the budget spreadsheet that are under the jurisdiction of this committee take into account um, the needs of communities. I mean, obviously the lion's share are LGA, CPA, the other aids, a number of aids to counties. Um, my counterpart, Mr. Swanson, might have some more detail, but um, if you'd like to drill down on that, let's talk about it a little bit more um, to be able to fully answer your question. Mr. Swanson. Uh, Madam Chair and Representative O'Driscoll, I was just trying to look through my notes to see if there is um, maybe ever a time that exempt, you know, publicly owned exempt property was a part of the LGA formula. Um, I don't believe that was the case, but I'd, I'd maybe want to take a little bit closer look at that. Um, but th that's really the only thing I can think of that, that would have um, sort of addressed the issue as directly as, as you're indicating that sort of, you know, takes a look at the, the amount of exempt property and, and applies aid directly based on that. Representative Descrell. I just want to follow up on that. So our LGA and county program aid formulas don't have a provision to address that right now for those communities that have those regional or district hubs where there's, again, schools or highway state patrol facilities and, and things that might otherwise um, been, if you will, taxable if they weren't in the hands of, of the state or, or what have you. Michelle or Mr. Swanson. Uh, Madam Chair and Representative O'Driscoll, not directly. Um, as Mr. Carlson mentioned, um, you know, the county program aid formula does take into account tax base. Um, the LGA formula does that as well. Um, but that's, that's really um, sort of looking at the tax base as a whole, which, which would you know, not include any non-taxable property. So there is sort of some accounting for that. Um, but there's not a direct um, formula factor that, that is, is solely linked to um, the type of property that you're talking about. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great. I'm kind of disappointed Representative Quam isn't here anymore, but I want to note that um, the handout Michelle was referring to earlier um, has now been passed out to all of the members. And so um, we do have time for a couple more questions of if Representative Quam comes back. Uh, I uh, want to go to Representative Elkins next. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. So I, to follow up on that, and I think Mr. Swanson may have just uh, kind of answered the question. The, the one factor I have noticed in the uh, LGA formula is that they have the factor for per capita tax base, which would kind of indirectly capture it, perhaps not adequately, but I, that's the only thing that I could see that addresses that. Mr. Swanson? Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Elkins, that's correct. Um, that's, that's kind of the, the point I was trying to make is that there are these other tax base factors within the LGA and CPA formulas, but um, nothing directly related to exempt property. Great, thank you. Uh, well, Chair Lissagarde, would you like to wrap things up? I sure will. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and committee members for the discussion. Um, as you've seen in this committee that we, we tried to, to lay out what the, what the issues are and property um, tax increases is a big deal. And this bill is going to help. It's one of them levers and I'm glad to have bipartisan support. Um, and it's going to help uh, reduce taxes um, for people who really need it and uh, in this, into the counties and the townships. But they provide services that, um, you know, for all the different roads, I, I appreciate. I think it was uh, Anderson that was at, Representative Anderson asking about all the different roads for the townships and the counties and all of this and, and all the services they provide. And uh, this is, this is, a, this is a, one of the levers that I think is important that we do get it to the governor's desk and, uh, and, and, and along with local government aid and, and, and CPA and PILT and all of these different levers to lower the taxes for the people that are struggling. So that's what this bill is and uh, I would appreciate your support. Thank you. Great, uh, Mr. Chair, do you renew your motion to lay over No, okay. Okay, I guess we'll just have to show. Oh, there we go. Well, so for folks online, um, Mr. Chair, would you like to renew your motion to lay over House File 825 for possible consideration in the Property Tax Division report? Yes, so moved. So moved, okay. Yeah, what's up? No. 
Okay, next we have, uh, thank you, uh, Vice Chair Lee. Um, next we have uh, House File 880, uh, Chair Gomez. Would you like to present your bill? Or motion to uh, lay it over for a possible inclusion? Yes, please, Mr. Chair. Okay, so House File 880, um, Chair Gomez lays over for possible inclusion to the tax omnibus bill. Please present your bill. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So House File 880 is the um, Office of the State Auditor's bill um, on about technical changes to tax increment financing law. That's why the state auditor is up here next to me. Um, so since this does just sort of make technical and policy changes, I'm just going to turn it over to her team to walk us through the bill. Um, I think the auditor is going to give us a little bit of kind of context of her office's interaction with tax increment financing, and then we're going to have one of her staff come up and, and go through the specifics. I think this house is going to go. So if, with your uh, permission, Mr. Chair. Well, of course, uh, Madam Chair, um, <laughs> to the state auditor, please present. First off, I do want to thank you for moving me up one on the agenda. So I'm just going to get myself organized here. <laughs> so I'm excited for that. I think somebody pressed a button up here. Like the, you're trying to get your uh, presentation up on the screen there. I have no idea what happened. Okay, excuse me. Trying. Well, as this goes up. Oh, there we go. <laughs> there we go. Hey now. All right. Uh, Chair Liz Lagarde, uh, <laughs> Vice Chair Lee, Lee Quam, thank you, and members of the committee, thank you so much for allowing us to present uh, our tax increment finance uh, clarifications bill. Um, I am joined today by uh, OSA TIF Director Jason Nord, um, who can go over the details of the bill. Um, also, uh, want to uh, thank all the people who helped us put this together. Uh, we have a group called the, uh, the uh, TIF Oversight Advisory Group. It's a fun um, acronym if you pull that together. Uh, and it included uh, members, uh, staff of local government, LMC, Metro Cities, MICA, AMC, MASBO, MSBA, Greater Minnesota Cities, really great, um, very great technical support uh, to help us put together a bill that ideally uh, works to clarify things so that we can implement the will of the legislature. That's our goal with this bill. And so with that, if it's possible, uh, we could have uh, Director Nord um, pr present the details. Yeah, thank you so much for being with us. Yeah. Can grab another chair? Huh? Is that okay? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Welcome, Mr. Nor. If you could state your name for the record and then please uh, continue with your presentation. Uh, thank you, Chair Liz Lagarde and members. My name is Jason Nord and I'm the director of the TIF division at the Office of the State Auditor. And I'm happy to uh, explain the various provisions of the bill. Uh, the first subject our bill addresses is administrative expenses. Uh, so current law defines administrative expenses and it provides a 10% limit on those expenses. So section one of the bill just improves the definition of administrative expenses. Currently, the law is uh, just list things that are not administrative expenses. So we're adding a list of things that are administrative expenses. And a couple of the key changes are uh, maintenance and operating costs for properties that are purchased with tax increments are included as administrative expenses, whereas property taxes paid on TIF purchase properties are excluded as administrative expenses. And then section four of the bill clarifies um, a few things about the administrative expense limit. First, it uh, clarifies how return increment is treated in the calculation of the limit. So the limit is based on net increment after you may have returned some increment. Um, and then because maintenance and operating costs are now defined as an administrative expense, but those costs can be quite large, 
the appropriate source for paying those kind of costs is the lease proceeds when you're leasing out properties. So we're making an exception from the 10% limit that if you're using lease proceeds, uh, which are defined as tax increment, um, to pay those costs, then those are not subject to the limit. Um, bef sorry. Before moving on to the next major topic, there are three very miscellaneous, very technical changes. Section two is just adding a definition of pay-as-you-go notes. Uh, pay-as-you-go notes are one of the main um, types of, fun it is the main type of funding used. You know, tax increment financing, you pay for a project up front with some kind of bond or note. Uh, pay-as-you-go notes are the most common types of notes that finance the project, and then tax increments pay off those bonds over time. And so currently, statute doesn't have a definition of that term, and we're simply adding that um, because we're talking about it a lot in the pooling changes. Section three uh, is a very minor reporting change, allowing us to capture the year of first receipt instead of requiring us to capture the month and year of first receipt. The month is no longer important. Section five uh, corrects a grammatical flaw in the statute. The, the current general rule that says you have to spend uh, increment to pay off debt and, and in accordance with your TIP plan, it's a sentence fragment. So we're completing the sentence by also clarifying that um, it's okay to spend money on administrative expenses. So then the next major topic um, that we're addressing with sections six through nine of the bill is something called pooling. And you may wonder what the heck is pooling and what are the pooling limits that we're changing. So um, just a little bit of background here. Uh, the, the illustration here highlights um, the, the statutes that actually allow you to use TIF are allow you to create project areas. And those project areas can be bigger than just the, t the individual TIF districts. Um, so in this illustration, there are three TIF districts within a project area. And what pooling is, is pooling is when you expend money outside of a TIF district in the larger project area. The idea being like you're pooling increments from different districts to pay for larger project costs. Um, but it's also called pooling even if there's only uh, one TIF district involved. And so there are a series of limits. Uh, the first limit is the overall pooling limit. And the overall uh, pooling limit, um, because you might wonder, well, why, are, why can you use TIF funds outside of the TIF district? Why don't they all have to be used in the TIF district? Well, some of those development costs don't fall on the property themselves. You might have uh, neighboring road improvements or lift stations, or you may have like externalized costs that aren't on those parcels but are still part of redeveloping those parcels. So to kind of put a limit on how much uh, increment can be spent outside of a district, but in the larger project area, um, statute has an overall pooling limit, and that's 25% for redevelopment districts, and it's 20% for all the other district types. And there is an option to increase pooling by up to 10% if you're going to do that for affordable housing purposes. Um, there are then two different rules that um, zero in on some greater pooling restrictions. They're called the five-year rule and the six-year rule. And way back in the 80s, the legislature had a major problem with TIF because a lot of districts were being kept open for their maximum duration because authorities were using um, that as an increment stream to spend money on anything they could think of over the 25-year duration of the district. So uh, the five-year rule, five rule and six-year rule were put into effect to say, no, let's focus on what costs are necessary to make the project happen, not just any um, expenditures. <coughs> and so the five-year rule defines as in-district only those costs that occur in the first five years. If you come up with new cost obligations or, or, or new things to spend money on after those first five years, you can do that, but it has to fit within your pooling limit. And so the five-year rule defines what's in-district and out-district. And then the six-year rule says that once you pay off your in-district obligations or you have enough money to pay off your in-district obligations, you have to decertify. Um, and then there's also a second restriction in the, uh, in the six-year rule that imposes an annual limit on the in-district share of your increment that you receive each year you have to spend in-district. Um, so uh, this slide illustrates kind of the, the effect and the benefit of the early decertification that those rules are requiring. Um, if you decertify once you have enough increment to cover the necessary costs, then you decertify early, which means that all the public benefits of a TIF district, you know, 
creating new tax base, all that gets moved up earlier and you get to enjoy more benefits and you get to enjoy those benefits earlier. So that's, that's the importance of the five-year rule and the six-year rule. But there were many ambiguities um, regarding all of these pooling limits that we're trying to clean up. So section six clarifies the overall pooling limit. It uh, clarifies how um, increment that is returned is handled. And so pooling limits will be calculated on the amount of increment you receive net of any uh, increments that you have returned. And we're broadening a cross-reference that deals with some county costs. Right now, county costs for road costs are not part of the pooling limit. And I think it's widely understood that county administrative expenses would also not be subject to the pooling limit. And we're just broadening a cross-reference to help make that more clear. Uh, section seven makes some technical changes to the five-year rule. We're just uh, clarifying some of the language that might be confusing. We're deleting an obsolete reference to some biotech zones. And we're removing the reference in the five-year rule to that extra 10% of pooling for housing, the 2D pooling, um, because I think it's better handled in the six-year rule. Current law was defining that extra 10% as both being in district and out district. So um, that created some confusion. Uh, then section eight is making substantial changes to the six-year rule. First of all, we're removing that extra annual limit on increment. Um, for one, it was difficult, I think, for authorities to understand and realize that it was even an additional limitation. It was also difficult for us to monitor and actually see and identify. And I think it was of questionable value when you already have the overall pooling limit. This was adding just such a marginal additional pooling restriction that it was, it was really just catching people uh, for lack of awareness rather than being an effective additional pooling limitation. So uh, removing that and instead we're um, focusing on the early decertification requirement and we're really trying to make that also uh, much more clear and understandable. We're, the current law has some ambiguous language about you need to set aside money but there's no formal identification of what that mechanism is. So we're replacing kind of the vague language with a calculation so that it'll be easier for authorities to see when they have to decertify um, and to comply. So we're going with a calculation approach. Um, it was also unclear as to how pay-as-you-go notes would be treated with respect to the six-year rule, because if you have some parcels that are not subject to a pay-as-you-go note, there was a question as to whether, well, does all the increment from those parcels force you to decertify early and cut off a note before the note holder um, and maybe causing harm to the note holder. Or if you kept the district open for the whole length of the note, then you have extra parcels that aren't uh, where the increment from those parcels isn't legally able to be used for anything. And that's not wise either. So uh, we're clarifying that you can stay open for the duration of one of those notes, but you have to remove parcels that are no longer subject to any obligation. Uh, and then sections nine to 12 deal with just, uh, or I'm sorry, section nine is the last pooling change. There's a special pooling for deficits provision in current law that if you have deficits in a TIF district due to the 2001 tax reforms, you could do some pooling to help cure those deficits. And current law um, just meant to identify a deficit as one amount minus the sum of two other amounts, but instead it was written as one amount minus the second amount plus the third amount. Uh, and um, I'm not a math expert, but those are different results with those calculations. Uh, so. If I can, um, thank you, Chair Lizard. Uh, this is my favorite section as a former math teacher. <laughs> <laughs> so the, la the last three provisions in the bill um, deal with, there's a statute that deals with uh, how to address violations. And um, section uh, 10 uh, removes an obsolete sentence in the um, provision that deals with if you've improperly received tax increment. Um, I think that sentence was written way back in 1990 when it assumed, it, it made a false assumption about how things were actually gonna work. And so we're just uh, deleting that sentence because it's causing confusion. Um, section 11, uh, just streamlines some language uh, relating to withholding of increment. It, the um, prior law was really complicated because they tried to make it really complicated and they removed that complication a long time ago. And so now it's super wordy and we can just make it less wordy. Um, and section 12 uh, uh, deals with violations when you expend increment in violation of a limit. 
Uh, there, and it only references the main section that has most of the limits, but there are limits in other parts of the TIF Act. So we're just broadening the reference to the, to the main limit section to the whole TIF Act so that um, we don't create confusion there about violating limits in other sections. And so um, those are the, the clarifications. I know TIF is a complicated subject. I'd be happy to answer any questions um, either now or following up afterwards. Uh, please just contact uh, Donald or myself um, and we can follow up. Thank you. I believe we have uh, one testifier. If the testifier could come up, Mr. Carlson. State your name for the record and please proceed. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, my name is Gary Carlson. I work with the League of Minnesota Cities. I want to thank uh, Chair Gomez for authoring this bill. Uh, for those of you who served on the tax committee last year, you may remember that about 98% of this bill uh, was from last year's tax bill that was approved. Uh, and so we, we do strongly support that. What I really want to uh, echo today, uh, and I'm not going to test you on TIF. I think Mr. Nord is the one that could do that. But uh, there was a process established by the state auditor this last uh, couple of years to really review the TIF statutes, which are very complicated and do require quite a bit of expertise. And I uh, talked with the auditor and I talked with Mr. Nord and I, they have assured me they want to continue this process to bring you bills that have been vetted by all of the interested parties uh, that we can all agree to. So uh, we're committed at the League of Cities to working on that process. We do strongly support the bill and we would encourage you to support passing and including this in the omnibus bill. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. Thank you. I believe we have uh, Mr. Bagnoli. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Joe Bagnoli. I'm with the law firm of Winthrop and Weinstein, and I'm here today representing the Minnesota Institute for Public Finance in support of this bill. Uh, I'm <clears throat> testifying today because later this session you will see what the, my, the organization that I work with is made up of, of attorneys, uh, public uh, finance uh, advisors to cities and counties and, and, and public entities. Uh, and bankers, and we come out every year with similar to, well, many of our folks work on these same TIF issues, um, and we would just want to support this idea that uh, Mr. Carlson just discussed about having a continuing conversation about uh, TIF. This is the first one in a long time. This is great work um, that's been done by the, uh, the auditor's office and, and others. We do the same sort of thing, and you'll be seeing it later um, with regard to public finance, where we, it's sort of a, what I think of it always as, as the uh, Department of Revenue comes out every year with a technical bill. We do the technical bill for, we suggest a technical bill for public finance provisions, just as in many cases, this is a technical bill for TIF provisions. Thank you, just wanted a little preview and support the bill. Okay, is there any uh, member questions? Mr. Anderson, or thank Representative you, Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in the supporters of the bill, I see that the League of Minnesota Cities and Metro Cities are in support. I don't see the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities. Is that just uh, they weren't aware of this? Uh, any opposition or um, anything to do with the smaller cities outstate Minnesota? Mr. Chair, if we could have, or yeah, yeah. I mean, Mr. Carlson, can Mr. Come Carlson, help us out on this one. Mr. Chair, members, Gary Carlson with the League of Minnesota Cities. Uh, Representative, uh, all of those cities are members of the League as well, and I don't believe the coalition takes any positions on the overall structure of the tax increment financing law. That usually is left to us as the statewide association. But I have heard no concerns from any of our members, either in Greater Minnesota or otherwise, and we also had uh, members from Greater Minnesota that were involved in this working group with the OSA. Uh, uh, Please. Thank you, Chair Liz Lagarde, uh, Representative. Uh, we did also have um, a member on there. I may not have just assigned homework to everybody, uh, but it was certainly not because they didn't agree. Uh, but we did have uh, a member there who was really helpful to us on this. Thank you. Representative Anderson, any other questions? Oh. Representative Quam. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And in case there's somebody watching this now live or, or later, that does have concerns, please, uh, you can find the committee members' names and, and send that. But my understanding 
from the testimony is that everything is happy, happy, joy, joy, and no, uh, no tears. Well, thank you, uh, Representative Quam. That's what we try to do around here is please, please, please. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you so much. Okay, um, we, uh, House File 888 is laid over for possible inclusion in the Property Tax Division Report. Oh, 880. Yeah, I think we're waiting for uh, Representative Ryer. Speak of the devil. Okay, next we have Representative Ryer on a bill of soil and water conservation district. The chair moves that House File 735 be laid over for possible inclusion in the property tax division. Please thank, continue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, committee members, first of all, my apologies for not being here. I was watching upstairs on TV. I was riveted and uh, didn't get back here in, <laughs> as quickly as I thought. Pretty riveting, wasn't it? So, so I'm here today to talk about House File 735. This bill would establish a soil and water conservation district aid program, similar to other forms of state aid to local government. This would be a standing statutory appropriation of general funds from the Department of Revenue to SWCD statewide in the amount of $22 million per year. State funding for SWCDs is something that has been a topic of legislative discussions for several years. In my experience with this bill in the past two years, it's a bipartisan issue, and I thank all of my co-authors from both sides of the aisle. Now, our current budget outlook presents an opportunity to finally provide SWCDs with stable and predictable funding. This will allow SWCDs to better focus on their mission of conservation implementation with private landowners. SWCDs provide these landowners with technical assistance, funding, and educational services. They're a primary source of conservation information, support, and program management for landowners and other local units of government. They're the technical experts and boots on the ground, and as water quality and soil health issues are prioritized in Minnesota, SWCD's roles have expanded and now include helping landowners navigate laws and programs that are increasing in complexity. We all know that unpredictable levels of resources make it extremely difficult to manage any organization. In this case, the effort to ensure SWCD funding every two years eats up an unnecessary share of resources in the form of staff, time, and effort. Mm -hmm. We can fix this now and provide stable, ongoing resources for the SWCD system. Now I'd like to welcome our testifiers who will provide more details about the bill and the benefits it would bring. Thank you, please uh, state your name for the record and continue. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Repre Representative Weyer, for carrying this bill. Uh, I'm Chuck Rowell. I'm a uh, supervisor at the Benton County uh, SWCD, and I'm the current president of the Minnesota Association of Soil and Water Conservation Districts. Uh, MASWCD represents uh, the state's 440 elected SWCD board members, like myself, and there are more than 460 uh, resource professionals. As an elected unit of uh, local government, our current funding is shared between both state and local resources. Counties have been a strong partner for the local share of the funding and we certainly appreciate their support. State funding, uh, however, uh, in the past several years has been a bit of a struggle. We are truly grateful <laughs> for the clean water fund appropriations that we've been receiving to provide our boots on the ground uh, projects across the state. But every two years we need to face that challenge and uncertainty around that funding source. So the, uh, the funding proposed by the uh, uh, by the SWCD uh, aid legislation would provide a more efficient and longer term funding mechanism that would allow SWCDs across the state to better focus their manpower and resources on their locally uh, identified projects. With appropriately $14 million that, uh, of continued contributions from our county partners and the $22 million SWCD aid, we can come much closer to fulfilling our funding needs. 
This would also allow us to more adequately leverage federal conservation resources and increase our pace of progress toward meeting our goals of soil health and clean water. In addition, it would allow more of the clean water fund dollars to go to on the ground implementation in the future. Now, what would we do with these funds if we had them? Well, some examples, and I'll start with Benton uh, SWCD, my own district. Uh, we would look to hire an additional uh, technician that would allow us to identify, evaluate, and facilitate more water quality and uh, soil health projects, primarily funded by federal grants, and provide additional ser uh, services to producers who are interested in taking part in our uh, Minnesota Agricultural uh, Water Quality Certification Program. Uh, Crow Wing SWCD. Uh, they would look to devote staff time and resources to projects like rerouting an ATV uh, trail around a lake to mitigate uh, soil erosion. They currently don't have the <coughs> resources to address this. Uh, Clay County SWCD would be able to enhance staffing to meet landowner interest in soil health practices such as cover crops and purchase equipment for assisting in the establishment of uh, pollinator habitat. And finally, uh, Dakota SWCD, again, would hire a uh, conservation technician for one-on-one -on -one, uh, landowner outreach and project implementation. Now, recent surveys have shown that SWCD staff are well-respected and trusted by landowners. These re relationships are the core element in our ability to facilitate the voluntary projects that utilize both state and federal conservation funds. So those are just a few examples of how uh, SWCDs across the state would use this funding to boost their capacity in getting conservation projects implemented and increase our ability to utilize, utilize the significantly projected increase in uh, federal dollars coming available for uh, conservation projects. With that, I thank you for your consideration of this SWCD bill and the consideration of how important it is to our conservation system and finally, we appreciate the support that we received last year uh, in our efforts and certainly hope to see that continued support this session. Thank, Thank you. you. I believe there is one more testifier. Ray. Welcome. If you could please state your name for the record and proceed. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is uh, Ray Bone. I'm here today representing the Minnesota Association of Watershed Districts. And the reason I'm here is that uh, the SWCDs are a very strong partner with us around Minnesota. And we work together. And in some cases, we even have SWCDs that are actually managing the watershed district. So we have, a, again, a very strong relationship with them. We work with them. We've been supporting this need for th their additional capacity uh, probably for six to eight years and we would hope this is the year that they get the type of permanent funding that they need to 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 really excel I think go to that next step right now when you live by primarily grants and things like that it's very difficult because if you lose a grant then you you may lose a good staff person, someone that you've spent a lot of money developing, and then who knows, maybe a watershed district or another SWCD comes along or the DNR picks them off. And you know that, that just costs uh, everybody a lot of extra money. So uh, that's just one small example. We work with the SWCDs in some of our smaller projects, and uh, we help them out. They help us out. Uh, we hire them when we can. Uh, we try to go to them and, and uh, work with them as best we can. So anyway, uh, with that, I just wanted to say us too. We really believe this uh, is an important element, important consideration, this, uh, this aid to bring some permanency and uh, uh, long-term vision to, to these SWCDs. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Member questions? Representative Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, yeah, I, I fully support the work that these these folks do uh, <coughs> back home in the counties. Uh, they do excellent work, and I, I support it. Would like to ask just a question about how how Hennepin and Ramsey counties are organized. If they don't have SWCDs, what type of organization 
limit structure do they have that uh, would handle this, uh, the, these funds? If you could state your name for the record. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Uh, Sheila Vanny, MASWCD Assistant Director. Um, good to be here this morning. Uh, Representative Ans uh, Anderson, to your question, in Hennepin and Ramsey, there was special legislation to um, direct the uh, statutory duties of an SWCD to the county in those two cases. So uh, county staff deliver on the programs and duties of an SWCD in those two unique cases. So that's why they would be eligible um, for this SWCD aid uh, in addition to all the other 88 um, standalone uh, SWCDs. Representative Anderson. So they have dedicated staff that would work with this and do projects in these counties then, correct? Ms. Vanny. Mr. Chair, yes, that's correct, Representative. Okay. Representative Anderson. Thank you again, Mr. Chair. Um, the actual funding itself is going to be broken down into by divided up by, I believe, three different metrics. Could you explain what uh, what those metrics would do? The population one I, I, I get, but what about the non-public land? How would that 20% be divided up uh, among the the SWCDs? Ms. Manny. Mr. Chair and Representative Anderson, the uh, the two aspects of this funding that are not going out equally to all SWCDs are viewed as oversimplified stand-ins for workload. Um, so we know that SWCDs work primarily on private lands mm -hmm. with private landowners on voluntary incentive-based conservation practices. So that's a huge driver of their workload is how many private acres there are in their SWCD. Um, there isn't a definition of, of private lands in statute, though, so that's why this, the, the way that it's worded is a little bit convoluted, right, to kind of look at it as non-public <laughs> instead of private. Um, but that's what that's intended to do. And then um, we also know that um, in some of the large SWCDs, um, the, the same amount of acreage may be held by you may see large holdings, uh, land holdings, where there's only one landowner to actually cooperate with on, on 500 to 1,000 acres. So that there's a distinction between the how many people do you need to work with and how much acreage do you need to get projects on the ground um, for. So the, the population aspect um, was brought in to help deal with that. But we also know that you know, SWCDs aren't working with residents of an apartment building, for example. Um, so we weren't trying to put um, a, a huge um, allocation to that percentage, but to instead be trying to balance the how many how many uh, landowners for the acreage that we're working with. Representative Anderson, thanks again, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. So. On that, the population, population piece, would that again skew more heavily to Hennepin and Ramsey counties? Ms. Fenney. Mr. Chair and Representative Anderson, there would, that's why the, the language is um, including a tiered approach um, so that Hennepin and Ramsey would be in the, in the highest tier, um, but that how the threshold or the marks for where you break those um, percentages of the entire state's um, population, you know, that it would probably be, and we, and I admitted we have not um, fully fleshed this out with the bill author and, and partners at Department of Revenue and, and the Board of Water and Soil Resources yet as to where those, those breaking points are for the different population thresholds. But just for example, you know, you could say, Tier one has, you know, anywhere from 0.1% um, of the state's population to, you know, whatever the amount is, and then so you, you and everyone in that tier gets 35,000, and you know, just break it down um, like that instead of it being a direct one-to-one -one kind of ratio where, um, where you're right, most of that component of the funding would otherwise go to Hennepin and Ramsey. Representative Anderson. Representative Quam. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And it'd be nice if the um, at, we actually had before us 
the exact, uh, if you use a formula or if you do by tiers and how that'd be broken out because that would, would help us understand that. Um, the other thing is I didn't hear commercial and multi-unit versus uh, you know, farms and uh, residential. Because you, as you mentioned, the quantity of programs for apartment dwellers isn't gonna be you know, relational to the number of apartment dwellers. Um, so did you take into consideration multi-unit uh, capacity with uh, the, you know, you're trying to quantify projects <coughs> is what you stated. I'm trying to better understand exactly what you're doing. Since I don't have a formula um, or, or a map with uh, gradations for these different subcomponents. Ms. Benny. Uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Quam, the definition of non-public acres that we're using is um, pointing to the uh, statutory definition for real um, property. And so I would, um, I don't have that in front of me right now, but um, the, um, I'm sorry. M Mr. Chair, we have somebody that could probably tell us that information. Ms. Shill? Um, Mr. Chair and Representative Quam, um, I don't have that level of detail with me. Actually, SWCD funding has been handled by the Natural Resources Committee and the other fiscal analyst who has been tracking that money from the Clean Water Fund, I assume would also would have the runs. So we could perhaps work with um, our testifier and um, my counterpart for that committee uh, to get information. Mr. Chair, I, I apologize for not being clear enough. I thought the uh, thing was definition of non-public land, and I thought that was something that would probably stretch across multiple uh, um, areas, especially since non-public is treated differently in the property tax committee. I was hoping that we had someone here that could tell us what the statutory definition referenced by the testifier was. Well, Mr. Uh, or Representative Quam, we will get that to you. I apologize that it's, they're not here right now, um, but we will we'll get you that information. Um, Representative Quam. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Now, looking um, at this uh, distribution, so 70% is pretty easy to figure out. Um, I, I apparently offline, you'll get the members of this committee details on how the other 20% in one bucket and 10% in another bucket are distributed so we can fully understand the uh, exactness and how it interacts with with other funding. Uh, what percentage of funding increase is this? Ms. Fanny. The, excuse me, uh, Mr. Chair, the, um, the percent of increase as compared to what we're getting right now in clean water funds. So, that is correct. Um, I'm, I'm not going to do public math, sorry, <laughs> we, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, we're getting 12 million per year right now in clean water funds this biennium. And so that's, um, that would be increasing to 22 million, um, not quite double. Um, but when we um, got the $12 million per year in clean water funds, we, we knew at that time that it was not anywhere close to meeting our needs. And when we are getting allocations in the clean water fund, there's a very, um, there's, I don't wanna call it competition, but there are a lot of other elements of programmatic needs and um, project needs that are in that sphere of funding that don't allow our um, side of that to increase at the level that we need it to. Um, and, and honestly, we would prefer to see those um, clean water funds go to the on the ground project implementation funding um, that, that we're working with landowners on. Representative Quam. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So this will be t adding 22 million to 
12 million where our, I thought the bill was um, so the same fund <laughs> source is is being used as opposed to um, that I, I like some clarification I I just want to make sure that the same bucket of money is going to be giving us 22 million instead of 12 or there's a different bucket of money that we've been getting it from before Ms. Schill uh, Mr. Chair and Representative Quam, um currently SWCD funding from the state is coming from the Clean Water Fund at 12 million per biennium. It has been for the past three biennia a direct appropriation of 12 million from the Clean Water Fund. This proposal would give it a more permanent funding source from the general fund. The bill um, provides 20 mil two million per year or 44 million and then you have um, interactions um, for the biennium so it would be roughly doubling the amount per year representative Quam. okay so um, this bill doesn't preclude additional clean water funds from being given to as has been the general practice Mr. Chair and Representative Quam, no, it does not, but it's the intent of the Natural Resources Committee to not make that appropriation if this particular funding source is approved. Representative Quam. One or the other. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my rough guess is it's 83.3% increase in, in funding. Um, you know, which I, I would like to understand what are the specific areas that are going to be getting the funding. Um, and since it's already getting 12 million, what is the distribution formula utilized? So how is it changing uh, distribution of money to counties? So I, I, I would hate to see an 83% increase um, end up where there's some county because of the allocation stuff is uh, um, is different so 70% goes across to everybody and depending on how that other 30% is it is conceivable that you'd have a county or you said there are 88 plus two counties that are getting this so that's 90 I thought we had 87 counties um, but uh, you know I just want to be reassured that n since we're changing the source and we're adding this extra stuff that we aren't accidentally causing some um, one, one of the entities from getting less funds because I think the intent is to have them all gain more funds so they can more fully uh, perform these duties um, can I get some uh, you know some information that will help me feel more uh, safe with that or do we wait till another time uh, um, you know, offline. Representative Quam, do you have a specific question for a sp specific data that you're looking for? Uh, Mr. Chair, I guess the easiest way to explain it is current 12 million distribution to the counties, 22 million distribution to the counties. So we specifically see to, to make sure that we don't. It's, I, I, I'm sorry it wasn't clear enough. We've got an old way of funding it. We've got a new way of funding it. How is that going to affect each of the individual counties? And, and apparently, uh, um, you know, there's 90 instead of 87. So I, I'd like to better understand, yeah. you know, the, how that goes. Well, we're, this is going to be laid over um, for possible inclusion. It's going to give an opportunity to gather more information, and we will provide that um, to you. But just doing the rough math, uh, going from 12 to 22, um, it's an increase, and so you'll have you'll have uh, you'll have more resources um, to do uh, the, the task at hand. Uh, I Mr. Chair, <laughs> normally in the real world, yeah. but in the legislative Why? world, I have seen occasions of where there's increased funding and some people actually got less funding. So that, that's why I'm trying to get the details. Yep. 
Oh, thanks. Uh, so, Chair Gomez. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I mean, I just, I'm, I'm thankful for, um, to Representative Ryer for bringing this forward. This has been, um, you know, from just from talking to the Natural Resources Chair and people who have been paying attention to this, you know, it's sort of this, it's, it's a public good, it's a thing that all, of, that all of our, that our entire state needs to make sure, you know, that, that our soil and water are, are healthy for our future generations. Um, you know, 70% of a $22 million allocation is $15.5 million, that's gonna go out equally to all of the counties. I can't imagine a scenario in which uh, a county that, where, where the allocation's currently going out, you know, equally to counties, we're changing it from 12 million to 15 million, and then we're, we have an extra 7 million on top of that that responds m to more specific needs. Um, so, I mean, just, it's an increase. There's not, there's not a way, since 15 million is more than 12 million, what they're getting right now, there's just not a way that any counties are gonna lose out. And I look forward to, you know, I know that we're gonna provide um, those specific runs, make sense that you wanna see those. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing that too, to seeing how that, you know, 20% um, and 10%, those allocations go out. Um, but I just, uh, I think this is a really good thing for us to do. And I'm, I'm happy that Representative Ryer has uh, stepped up to provide us with this solution. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any closing comments, Representative Ryer? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I would just like to close by saying that um, I appreciate detailed questions as a researcher and data person myself. And um, understand the need to be very concrete will follow up um, because those are some of the nuances that will make a real difference for some counties. I think the real strength of this is that district by district, they're starved for resources, they're scrambling, they're losing people, and it's important work that 70% is the kind of thing that is going to raise all boats for them. It's going to give them the stability that they need, the ability to attract and retain the talent that has built trusted relationships in their communities. And so from that point alone, I think we'll get great value as a state, and I appreciate your support. Okay. Um, House file 737 will be laid over for pos 735, yep, will be laid over for possible inclusion into the ominous tax bill. Thank you. Okay, N nothing else before the committee. We are adjourned.